Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Heroes Chronicles spin-off series for Heroes of Might and Magic 3. In Chapter 4, Tarnum must discover what had caused all of the good dragons to flee Avli, and then confront the Dragon Queen of Nyon. Immortality has a drawback. Loneliness. But Tarnum found friendship with the long-lived dragons, and happiness in the joy they drew from each day. Then, one bleak morning, the dragons disappeared, gone without explanation. And it was up to Tarnum to find out why. Alrighty folks, welcome back to the halfway point of the Heroes Chronicle series. We are on Chapter 4, Clash of the Dragons. So this will be a uh, campaign where we play the Rampart base, which is uh, one of my personal faves. To His Royal Majesty, the Elf King of Avli, I agree the Spring Festival was marred by the absence of the green and gold dragons. I have never known a good dragon to break its word, so when you wrote that they promised to participate this year, I immediately knew something was wrong. Although I've spent most of my recent years among dragons, I must admit I do not know where they have gone. I am grateful you realised the graveness of this situation by lending me your forces. Dragons only break their promises if there is powerful evil loose upon the world. I thought I would begin my journey by finding the old elven woman known as the Dragon Talker. She has lived with the dragons for longer than anyone. I will let you know what I learn. Sincerely, Tarnum Dragon Friend. Clash of the Dragons. When the good dragons disappear, Tarnum is drawn into an epic battle with Mutari, the Dragon Queen. His greatest struggle, however, will be learning to be human again. Scenario 1, the Dragon Talker. The good dragons are missing, and the only person who might know their whereabouts is the Dragon Talker. Tarnum must find her. Do not lose Tarnum. All heroes will be limited to level 6, but all of Tarnum's skills, spells and experience will transfer to the next scenario. Alright, impossible difficulty as usual, and we'll be starting with 5 sharpshooters. It is no surprise that the immortal hero came to live among the long-lived elves and dragons. He was still human after all, and humans need companionship. Soon, the dragons would learn how seriously Tarnum took friendship. For the past 20 or so years, I have lived among the elves in these beautiful forests. I have fought beside them, laughed with them, and learned their ways. Perhaps my favourite time of year is the Spring Festival. Everyone is so filled with happiness and a love for life. It's a cheerful time that helps me forget my past. But this year the festival was shadowed by the absence of the green and gold dragons. It's most unlike them to break a promise. And then last night the ancestors visited me. They had another task for me to complete, but I already knew what they wanted me to do. I know, I said. The dragons must be found. Even if the ancestors hadn't assigned me this task, I would have gone in search of the gold dragons. Over the years, these long-lived creatures have become my beloved friends. They understand what I am, and they do not fear me. To them, my past is just that, over. For the friendship they have shown me, I owe it to them to find out what happened. But first there was Werejack, the orphan boy I have been raising. I needed to find someone to watch over him. Wow, we got 14 sharpshooters. Yikes, this might be a very short mission. <laughs> Especially given this is a tiny map. You hear the thunder of hooves on the earth and turn to face your enemy. As a group of horsemen ride over a nearby rise. No, not horsemen, centaurs. Man and horse combined. You know them to be fierce warriors, and this shaggy lot seem to be prepared to attack. Wow, seven. That's <laughs> such a small number. Well, okay then. Considering our past, I almost didn't call upon Adrian, but she was the only one I trusted to watch the orphan boy I have come to think of as my son. As I approached her solitary hut, which I helped her build when we were still together, Adrian, a dark-haired beauty, opened the door. It's been a while, Tarnum, she said. 
I could tell by her tone that she wished it hadn't been so long. I need a favour, Edrienne, I said. What makes you think I'll help you? She said. She was still angry with me, still hurt because I ended our relationship with no excuse. Because I know you love Ware, Jack, almost as much as I. I must go away and I need you to watch over him. Where is the little devil? Hunting, I said. I don't want to be here when he gets back. I don't want to have to explain. Yeah, I understand. Explanations aren't your strong point, are they? She snapped. I sighed. Maybe I shouldn't have come here. Then Adrian said, I'll take him, of course. How long will he be gone? Should I tell him you're never coming back? That's not fair, Adrian. So what? I'm not feeling like being fair today. I shook my head. If I didn't leave now, I never would. It may be as short as a couple of weeks, I said, or as long as several months. I don't know yet. I'll tell him. Tell him I love him, Adrian, and I swear I'll be back as soon as I can. I turned away, telling myself that Werejack would be safe. By the ancestors, I prayed, let me find the dragons quickly. Okay, archery's pretty good. The centaurs that normally guard this sawmill from bandits beg to join your army in search of the dragons. As their leader explains, we've all fought beside them in battle, and each of us owes a blood debt to the dragons. If you do not let us join, then we shall take up your quest anyway. Sometimes, centaurs just don't take no for an answer, so you let them join your ranks. Yep, take what we can get. That might be a little bit too powerful for us right now. Gem. Wrong campaign. <laughs> I managed to convince the Elven King of Avli to send me to find out what happened to the missing dragons. He suggested I seek the Dragon Talker, an ancient Elven woman who lives among the good dragons. She knows them better than any other mortal, but after centuries living among the dragons, she has become a bit of a recluse. Finding her may be a problem. You hear a whistling sound whip by, and then you cry out and grab your shoulder. Your tunic and the flesh underneath are torn. Buried in the ground several yards behind you is an arrow. You don't see the archers until you turn toward the nearby trees. A group of elven outlaws step from their camouflage and attack. Wow, that is a good trade. Take that. Do I go for XP here is the question. Yes, I think I do. I like artillery, but how often am I even going to find... Uh, I will get it actually, because it is powerful. You wander across a group of adolescent centaurs wrestling each other, and as you approach they invite you to join them. When a man wrestles a centaur, he's a great disadvantage both of size and strength, but you have countless years of skill behind you. One by one you eliminate the teens until you stand victorious over them all. And just before you leave, they present you with a gift. Your prize for such a tremendous display of prowess. While in the service of Avli, I fought in the forest guard beside a young Vori elf named Jelu. He invented an interesting bow, used only by the most experienced archers. These elite troops were called sharpshooters. Using Jelu's design for the bow, I am training my own sharpshooters for the battle ahead. These bows have an excellent range and are far more effective than almost all other ranged troops. I just hope they serve me as well as they did Jellu. Oh, okay, so we're playing with sharpshooters as a specialty. Nice. Okay, that's pretty massive. The Stoic Dwarves aren't known for their carefree games, but when they do play, there is always a wager on the contest. As you join a group of Dwarves in an axe-throwing game, you bet your horse against the shield of the Dwarven Lords. A burly dwarf takes the first throw, hitting just above the bullseye. Unfortunately, the shaft of his axe is blocking the target. There's no way you can win. Gritting your teeth, you pitch your axe sidearm with all your strength, cleaving the first axe in two as you hit dead centre. To the amazement of the dwarves, you win. Nice. Get on, lad. You know, for this one, I am going to grab that. 
so we can build a town hall. I really don't think we can take on dwarves, unfortunately. Stubborn like all dwarves, this stocky band of warriors refuse to move from the path, nor will they listen to reason. Definitely getting earth magic. Full show. What could it be? I asked one of the elven captains. What could possibly keep the dragons from the festival? Are to imagine anything powerful enough to kill them all? Or imprison them? No such force exists. At least I hope it doesn't, the captain says. But the other alternative is just as unreasonable. Dragons never break a promise, and even if it was something beyond their control, they would have told the elven king about it and apologised for their absence. True, says the captain nodding. True. Then what? That is the question that plagues me. Need to head towards getting uh, Monair. As I began to formally organise my army, I appointed a dwarf named Kerbon as the Master of Supplies because his kind are obsessed with every minute detail. He'll make sure nothing turns up missing. During my first conference with Kerbon, he shook his head at the list in his hand and said, You don't expect me to support this army on what I have here, do you? Well, what do you need? Everything! Wood, gold, all gems, everything! Don't believe in any piles of resources lying around, and you best flag all their minds too. If such common work is too mundane for you, sir, then I'll ask someone to do it for you while you go off killing things. <laughs> I like this guy already. My kind of guy. Ooh, a teleporter, eh? That's a lot of unicorns. The elves are so willing to help me that I've had to tell many of them to return to their homes and wait. If I had need of them, I would send word. Obviously a strong bond has been formed between the elves and dragons, and I suddenly realise why I have chosen to stay among these people for so long. In the past, I rarely stayed anywhere for long because I never felt part of any one place. As an immortal, I would only make friends that would age and die before my eyes. But not the elves and dragons. Not only do they live for a long time, but when they form a friendship, there is nothing that can break it. I have learned that to reach the Dragon Talker, I must first pass through the Red Border Guard, and only the Keymaster in the Red Tent has the authority to give someone access. I just hope the dragon talker still lives. If something has happened to the dragons, then couldn't the same thing have happened to the old healer who lives among them? Earth is a random ass belt. Finally got money coming in, which is great. You lean against a tree to get out of the hot midday sun, but suddenly a pair of strong arms wrap around you. They squeeze the breath from your lungs and effortlessly lift you into the air, pitching you several feet away into the dirt. When you come to your feet, you notice the entire forest moves. The trees surround you and angrily close in for the kill. Wow, that's an insane trade, but I reckon we can do better. We do have sharpshooters after all. Christ. Sharpshoot is a disgustingly good early game.
So we haven't got spells yet. That's my only, uh, I guess, concern right now. Sharpshooters are tough cookies. Yeah, gotta go with Earth Magic. This morning, as we prepared to leave, an elderly elf approached riding on the back of a powerful stag. Despite his age, the elf was still agile enough to drop off his mount and extend a hand. I am Aspen, a druid, and your advisor, the old elf said. My advisor, I said. I don't recall asking for one, much less selecting one. <laughs> That's because my people selected one for you. They wanted someone wise and experienced, someone who knows much of the world. The choice, I admit, was obvious. I'm sure no one else was considered, since I am the wisest elf alive. And so modest, I said. <laughs> Modesties for halflings, Aspen said, jumping onto the back of his stag. So, where do we go today? I mounted my horse and said, I would think someone as wise as yourself would already know that. Aspen laughed, and we became immediate friends. Quite like uh, quite like that guy too. <laughs> I think we're going to have quite an uh, interesting set of characters this campaign. Looking forward to voice acting them all. Let's see, good little win. I uh, don't really want to fight Silver Pegside, to be perfectly honest. Okay, slow Ice Bolt, Bless. Okay, these are good spells. Ugh. I was hoping for logistics and pathfinding, but no such luck. Checkmate, Aspen said as he knocked over my wooden king with his rook. You're good, I said. My fists were clenched at my sides. I hadn't lost a game of chess in a very long time, and I didn't like it. Yes, although when you're this good, the game loses some of its appeal, I'm afraid, Aspen said as he scooped the wooden pieces into a pouch on his hip. Tomorrow, a rematch, I grumbled. It was even worse losing to this arrogant elf. You said you had some news, I said. Oh yes, I've arranged for troops to be trained at the Centaur Stables. Return there each week and they'll have new recruits waiting for you. Aspen tucked his board under one arm and walked away. Oh, bait. Yeah, I really want wisdom, but I need earth magic. We gotta go earth magic. I'm afraid. It's too good not to have. Last night I witnessed another trait that I have learned to love about elves. Even when the seriousness of our quest to find the dragons weighs heavily on their thoughts, my soldiers found time for a game. As long as they live, you would think the elves would become sombre, even boring. Yes, they are thoughtful people, always willing to consider the consequences of their actions before they act, but they also know how to live each day. Upon their request, I joined them. We kicked around a child's ball with no clear objective, other than keeping it away from the other team. I wish I could say my team won, but maybe next time.
Lovely, lovely. Is it worth getting in match three? I think it is. Ah, Mercury. Um. Oh, I don't have wisdom either. <laughs> That's funny. Never mind. I think I could do better than that. Well, that is a lot of troops. Oh, we've got one spell power. Okay. When I saw the green dragon swooping over the treetops last night, I thought my quest was over. Perhaps the good dragon simply forgot about the spring festival. I called out, waving for it to land so we could talk, but the dragon dove sharply at my position. If I had not known dragons so well, I would not have recognised its battle dive. It attacked! Luckily my men and I were able to take cover in a thick portion of the forest where the green dragon wasn't able to assault us, and eventually it gave up and flew away. But the malevolent expression on its face bothers me still. What could turn the good creature I know into the enraged beast I saw last night? Normally sensible, a pack of war unicorns blocks your path to the monolith ahead. They refuse to listen to reason, they snort and stomp about, taunting you, and then you notice a froth collecting in the mouths of the beasts. Wild weed. Unicorns normally know better than to eat wild weed, so you wonder if someone managed to feed it to them without them knowing it. Oof. I mean, that could have gone a lot worse. My master of supplies, Kerbin, gripes endlessly about the way I spend gold. What are you doing? Cropping it on the ground as you ride, he often says. Kerbin insists I visit the windmill and the mystical garden each week to pick up the gold and resources they provide. Anything to shut the dwarf up. <laughs> A report comes in that an elven farm was mysteriously ransacked last night. The field was torn up and all the animals were missing. Thankfully the farmer was away at the time. I sent Aspen to inves investigate the scene. Not much you're going to get here instead. Ideally, I'd want someone who's got um, artillery. I don't think that's going to happen.
Left Unicorn Valley, right unknown. A band of renegade dwarves blocked this path, knowing that someone would one day need to enter the valley beyond. One of the guard looks down at you from above and laughs. <laughs> if you want to pass, you gotta pay. 4,000 gold and 15 crystal is the current toll. Hold there while we count it, the dwarven guard says, and then disappears inside the tower. You wait for more than an hour, and just when you think you've been tricked, the doors open. You're free to pass, the dwarf says. <laughs> Not quite sure why the dwarf guard sounded like um, Trigger from uh, Only Fools and Horses. Alright, Marlene! <laughs> uh, all fun and games, isn't it? Alright, still no uh, ballista for me. Unfortunate. You're admiring the flowery fields around you when the ground suddenly gives out beneath you. You don't drop far, but by the time you pick yourself up, you find that you are surrounded. One of the little holes springs a horde of nasty eyeless creatures, troglodytes. These troglodytes must be the ones who have been raiding the local farms. One of them sniffs the air, then turns directly towards you. Ah. So you're the one we've been sent for, says the troglodyte. Come along now, and they attack. The sun reflects off something in a flower bed, so you dismount and carefully step between the beautiful flowers, so you don't crush any. And there, long forgotten, is the pendant of total recall. Aspen returns from his investigation of the ransacked farm. It's a true mystery, Tarnum. The entire farm was destroyed, and anything that was even remotely edible was stolen, Aspen says. Could it be a dragon? I ask. No, there were no tracks in or out of the farm, but there were plenty left behind at the site. They were small, and lots of them. I can't tell you what they belong to, the Elder Elf says, shaking his head. worth picking that up just in case oh, interesting we would love to let you through Tarnum a guard shouts from one of the windows but the one who holds the key to the gate slipped and hit his head last week his memory hasn't been the same since you see he forgot where he hid the key but I must get through you say well there is one chance if you could find the pendant of total recall, perhaps that will cure the gatekeeper's forgetfulness. It's worth a try, you say. Fortunately, I've already got that artifact. Ah, the pendant. Throw it up here. The guard disappears for a long time, and just when you think they've forgotten you, the doors open. Standing in the doorway with a sheepish grin on his face is the gatekeeper. <laughs> Sorry about that. Next time I'll leave the key under the doormat. Safest place. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? Well, we found the dragon. Ahead is the home of the dragon talker, but even as you approach you notice a pair of angry green dragons tearing through her gardens. They seem prepared to destroy the house and the dragon talker as well. Even as you draw your sword and attack, you regret your actions. To destroy such a beautiful creature is wrong, but you don't see any way to avoid it. Ah, greetings Tarnum. The dragons have spoken kindly of you. They call you a friend. Not many humans have earned such respect from their kind. So it is fitting that you become their champion. I fear for the good dragons, Tarnum. They were drawn from their caves as if pulled by some unseen hand. I saw it in their eyes. They could not resist and yet they did not want to go. Here, you will need these war unicorns to get safely back to the Elven King. Tell him that on behalf of the dragons I have selected you to save them. He is bound by his lines with the dragons to give you whatever assistance you request. Now, have a seat, Tarnum. The story I have to tell you might take a while. Let me make you some tea, and then I will tell you of what I know of your enemy. To begin with, let me tell you of the Dragon Queen of Nyon. 
Congratulations, you have over 20 war unicorns in your armies. Your enemies have no choice but to bow down before your power.